Hi everyone and welcome on Maxakova TV. Tonight in Synthetic Warfare, we have uh, our guest Yaroslav Romanchuk, a senior economist of exactly. Right Liberal Right Liberal Movement Ukraine. This is an NGO movement. that movement exactly Ruch in Ukrainian. Uh, it's my honor to be with you. I'm looking forward to our discussion and uh, elaborating on the events, trends of Ukrainian economy, and not only economy, probably well, what's really going on in Ukraine. As uh, from what I understand, there is always uh, little information, true information from on the ground in the world, in the English-speaking world. That's uh, probably that's a good idea to start a series of regular programs on what's going on in this country to make uh, it more understandable uh, for the whole world. And uh, if people understand what's going on here, probably they uh, would uh, uh, pay more attention and they would be more sympathetic to the course of Ukrainians and uh, supporting, more supporting in the uh, uh, victory. That's right. That's why we are doing it. And we are being... Uh, quite stubborn because even sometimes speaking in Ukrainian or Russian language, uh, we have not so many viewers because the themes are very, very serious. But now we are going to uh, explore our English speaking society audience and let's see if we are going to be more successful. Before we start very heavy subjects, uh -huh. I want to ask you a um, question. Well, I see that many are speculating on it, but still, uh, I want to know your opinion about that explosion of a drone somewhere. Oh, Moscow is Kremlin. falling. Moscow is burning. <laughs> Can you imagine it? This is Moscow falling? Exactly. Well, um, of course, we are not uh, military experts with you. We are not uh, in uh, in the information field flows of the military intelligence. That's why we can only observe what's going on. And from uh, different sources of information, different pieces of information, the one that I liked most was about this uh, dove that some Moscovites caught. Uh, and the dove was uh, in the national Ukraine colors. So now all janitors, all uh, policemen are ordered to uh, observe the sky to see whether there are any doves or military ants around that can possibly attack the Kremlin and other uh, government uh, buildings. Uh, I think that uh, that's a very big uh, psychological blow to the Kremlin, and uh, I think that would... Um, weaken dramatically the defense of the Kremlin, and that would uh, push uh, many Russians even closer to understanding and realizing the naked truth that Putin is a criminal, that he put Russia into the bloody mess that would eventually lead to the destruction of the Russian evil empire, uh, no, no matter who does it. So, who committed this uh, act? But mm -hmm. uh, that's a symbol that probably goes beyond uh, uh, Matthias Trust. If you remember the ah, Red exactly. Square landing uh, back in 1986, I believe, or 87. And I think that time that was also no a real threat to uh, the Soviet system. But psychologically, that means that uh, the Russian system uh, uh, is rotten, is weak, and uh, uh, its uh, management, its governance is good for nothing. So I think that's a very big uh, boost of morale for Ukrainians, for all people who, are, who have been fighting with the Russian regime all these years. Well, preceding that subject, a good example about Medios Rust, uh, by the way, his uh, uh, plane was a little bit bigger than that drone, but <laughs> yeah. the symbol, the symbol, uh, I think, remains. Um, they are uh, planning to do a parade on the 9th of May. Uh, what do you think? Um, will they do that parade, notwithstanding, not regarding to all these doves 
or drones that they are supposed to seek and neutralize in the skies. Uh, already <laughs> the last week, we had uh, some uh, news from uh, Russian different publics where yeah. they discussed that they should uh, survey all the time whether there is uh, no obstacle and no drone somewhere, um, somewhere in the sky. Well, the whole uh, evil empire will turn into one surveillance system that would uh, act as an entire defense system. <laughs> but that's uh, ridiculous, I believe. I think that uh, we know that uh, Putin has uh, many clones and uh, so he can uh, stage, uh, perform uh, this parade. And uh, essentially, even if he does it and the whole city, Moscow, would be... Uh, turn into a surveillance platform that would be that would show how scared these people are and uh, yes. that eventually they would uh, well people cannot live long in such the state of fear so that means that more and more people would see the imminent and inevitable end of the Russian evil empire and uh, the probability of a plot against Putin would definitely go up. And that's the fundamentally the outcome, the consequence of uh, the drone attack that we witnessed uh, today. Right. I think that our audience is already mm -hmm. slightly prepared for more <laughs> Uh, serious, subject. serious stuff, <laughs> and I suppose we are going to discuss first of all um, that uh, beautiful combination of words: grain from Ukraine, grain trade, sunflower and agricultural products, common agricultural policy of European Union, and the brutal reality of regulation. Well, uh, many people in Ukraine and in the world believe that European Union is about free trade, free capitalism. Uh, well, uh, we are gradually and as we're kind of, you know, uh, uh, observing the difference between free market ideas and the implementation and the protectionist uh, trade block. European Union is heavily regulated, and especially its common agricultural policy is nothing but socialism in many respects, like quotas, like licenses, permissions. Uh, there is a very limited area where you can exercise really free trade, free market there. Uh, what happened uh, was unexpected, both uh, by Poland, uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Slovak, Czechia, because uh, the uh, inflow of uh, Ukrainian grain was so big, it was like many times, 10 times, 20 times more than it was in the previous years. And there was there would be nothing wrong if that grain would transfer through or like would go in a transit mode through Poland and would be uh, uh, shipped to the destination uh, via the sea. But uh, Ukrainian exporters decided to use the storage facilities in Poland. And that and uh, a lot of grain, uh, instead of going to Africa, to other destinations where allegedly uh, there is a danger of food shortage and, and uh, famine, the whole grain landed in Poland and caused dramatic uh, dumping of prices. So Pol Polish farmers, uh, there are many, many thousands of farmers who did not sell grain in autumn and winter. Winter, they thought that grain prices would be very good uh, in the spring. And instead of that, they fed the situation when they were facing losses. And of I'm course, sorry, I want to, uh, to, to um, yeah, make a question. The storage of that grain yeah. costed already a lot of money, probably, to them. Well, or that's so uh, heavy. Well, the cost is one thing, but uh, if you offer uh, to Polish uh, uh, drain dealers a price which is like 20-30% lower than the price of Polish 
farmers or international farmers. And you dump the price. You dump, you dump the price, exactly. Well, that's what happened. In addition to that, uh, I uh, I heard that from uh, the Polish sources, uh, grain that was stolen from Ukraine by Russians also somehow landed in the European market uh, dumping the price. So uh, that was an, an unusual situation. And the Poland, uh, and one more thing that uh, also uh, describe can just uh, help you understand the position of the Polish government. Uh, 90% of all export of grain from Ukraine or import to Poland was done by one company, one Ukrainian company. That means that it was a deliberate effect, not by uh, free market farmers in Ukraine who wanted to sell their produce because they wanted to free their storage uh, facilities in Ukraine before uh, on the eve of the next harvest. But that was an attempt to uh, somehow... Uh, abuse the uh, this ability of uh, the uh, regulatory uh, window of opportunity that it was created by European Union and uh, this mixture of uh, of uh, kind of uh, irregular behavior, I would call it, with I have uh, still dumping. Some more questions. I have still some yeah. more questions because, for instance, if uh, someone came with grain from Ukraine and made a good price, not thinking about damping the price, he just wanted to get rid of a big amount, for example, and he was he supposed that the final destination of that grain will be in Africa, but he just. Uh, let another company do the logistics and so on. Can that be possible that this was a halfway um, transit? Uh, this way you halfway... must, uh, Maria, this way you must keep this grain in the so-called customs mode uh, facility, uh, customs warehouse, where it is, uh, according to the law, this kind of grain is not it has not entered the territory customs uh, territory of Poland, but that was not the case because all these Polish storage facilities were uh, located in Poland and where did not have this customs warehouse uh, mode. That is why that was. So technically... they cleared customs. They cleared customs with uh, Pol Poland, yeah, and yeah. it was already on yeah, the Polish that was market. On the, in the Polish market, exactly. I see. Okay, but uh, still another question. Uh, about that uh, other stolen grain that Russia managed to, I don't know how, but to mm. import still to uh, sorry to export uh, yeah, to right. export yeah. into Poland. I, as as far as I understand, there were two ways yep, of two getting ways. so much grain in Poland yep. Uh, yep. in those storages. Uh, what's the part of that stolen Ukrainian grain? that uh, Russia yeah, the problem Bro, was the, the problem that Polish farmers and the government faced was that there were two uh, unusually high density grain inflows into the Polish market. And the Polish farmers that were used to somehow orderly planned uh, uh, business faced this situation that uh, caused a lot of losses to them. European yes, Union. But it looks like the Russians have on purpose done it to. Yeah, well, to, the Russians, yes, but uh, that was part of the problem. The, the another, the the and the other half of the problem was that this uh, inflow of grain from Ukraine was by done by one Ukrainian company. I was told by uh, one Polish expert. So that means that we have to understand that the agrarian or uh, agricultural business, grain business in Ukraine, is not uh, free market. It's also, it has, we have a lot of uh, agricultural barons here. And one of the schemes why they did that was that and you, if you export grain that was not officially produced, like grain market grain, right? You still have uh, the right to claim VAT refund from the government. So even if you lose selling grain, you can get like 20% VAT refund from the government, and that can be 
quite a lot of money. So, uh, and as I was told, uh, Ukraine has 7 million hectares of land, which is not part of any cadaster. Just imagine, 7 million hectares of land that can produce a lot of grain, sunflower, whatever, and uh, all these agricultural products, if they are not part of the European Union, that's one thing. But if all these products, like in this force majeure, in the state of war, uh, are sold to European Union, farmers that cannot compete with this kind of schemes definitely protest and in Poland uh, the situation uh, uh, is heated by the political context because in October November Poland is having the next parliamentary election and that is why the Polish government uh, which relies heavily on the support of farmers uh, acted like that banning not only uh, import but also transit before all these issues are regulated mm-hmm and what's the way out now? The way out, well, ideally, uh, of course, uh, that would be uh, to abolish common agricultural policy altogether because this is the island of socialism in the European Union. Uh, common agricultural policy devours about 45% of the budget of the European Union. And at the same time, it's so heavily regulated. You have quotas, you have uh, licenses, you have regulation of all uh, crops. So it's it's it's... It's a, it's a really socialism, and uh, but but there is no such a thing on the agenda of the European Union. So uh, the fundamentally, your your Ukraine uh, should uh, learn a very good lesson that it must not rely on commodity export as a major source of hot currency revenue. It should diversify, and the only way to diversify economy is to free, to have free market economy, deregulate, make competitive uh, tax regulation, and in this case, you invite uh, investors, both Ukrainian and uh, Polish and uh, whatnot, and these investors will diversify economy and make it more attractive and, and diverse. And this is the only way. If you try to copy what European Union has right now, you end up nowhere. Of course, some farmers, big farm uh, agricultural business would benefit from it. But uh, Ukraine would no go further this uh, raw material cradle for European Union. Mm, I see. And um, in that case, uh, Ukraine can do many uh, decisions and reform in a way that Ukraine uh, thinks necessary its market. But it's hard to influence the regulation that is already done in European yep. Union. Yeah, you must so, adjust to that in order to, uh, uh, if you're not, if you decide to be part of this club, the club has its rules. So if you either you are part of the club and you abide by the rules, or you don't join the club, that's very simple. Norway and Switzerland uh, are members of EFTA, European Free Trade Area, because they want some issues for in case of Switzerland finance and money in case of Norway fish to be regulated by this common market. And there's a price for entering the common market. But first of all, primarily, Ukraine should put its own house in order and have a uh, cadaster, have, uh, you know, all this uh, order in uh, land ownership, have a uh, flexible, dynamic land market. And after that, it will be much easier for Ukrainians and Europeans to to find common grounds. All right, but right away, uh, if the situation looks like a little bit tough in Poland at the moment, uh, wouldn't be it right to find another um, logistic chain, maybe another hub, uh, as you said, in uh, Switzerland or somewhere else? Where no, no, Switzerland is not. No, no. Switzerland, Romania could be this hub. Romania, Romanian ports are used, but hopefully this year uh, we will free Crimea and the uh, Ukrainian fleet, uh, Ukrainian would uh, get back its sea routes, uh, which uh, definitely would help uh, the 
agri agricultural product producers uh, with the harvest they uh, are getting this year? Yes, I hope that very much too. Uh, but still, uh, we are now very depending on the yep. uh, decisions that are taken in the Eastern Europe. And as I can see that uh, uh, the European Union itself is not totally satisfied by that uh, decisions uh, which were taken practically by these five countries mm -hmm. and uh, well uh, maybe there is still a way to to find maybe i don't know uh, uh, some ways and some other hubs and some other logistic uh, chains and ways uh, not to uh, burden and not to harm too much uh, precisely these Polish farmers, but still to have uh, ways to export grain. Well, in this case, you know that uh, if we are talking about transit of grain or whatever agricultural commodity, yes. that's one thing. So we, there are ways, technical ways to uh, to avoid getting uh, well uh, uh, these products into the domestic market, EU market. So you can have uh, uh, cars in a special way uh, sealed so that these seals show that it's transit. You okay. can have the cars that follow trucks, and uh, as it is done with uh, uh, tobacco or alcohol. There are many ways to do that. But uh, essentially what should be done, uh, in fact, is that if presidents of the countries get together, prime ministers, and they set a deal, this deal must be followed. Otherwise, if agricultural producers do that on their own, uh, at their own risk, they should uh, face the consequences. In this case, uh, somebody who wanted to do business, you know, and he uh, performed in the way that jeopardized the uh, strength of the relations between Poland uh, and Ukraine on the one hand. And, uh, of course, uh, the ties are very, very good and the high quality interest and they do not, uh, cannot be kind of uh, uh, untied, risked uh, by grain or sunflower or whatever. So uh, there must be uh, clear dialogue and very um, detailed dialogue with uh, between the government in Ukraine and agricultural manufacturers inside the country. So that's something that is missing because if there is a dialogue or setting rules of the game between the government and these guys, then I think that uh, okay. then uh, we would not face the situation because in this case, what I saw is that that was somehow. Uh, came quite unexpectedly to the Ukrainian government that was not ready for this kind of reaction. But I think that they, the government got many signals because this kind of the volume of grain and other agricultural products was big, so big that it cannot be delivered overnight or within one okay. week. So the, there was a different flows that, uh, uh, that, that happened uh, for a certain period of time. Okay, so basically we have now, uh, as you say, these guys who uh, did not expect to face regulations of uh, higher level, and mm -hmm. that's the situation that came up just because they thought that they can uh, do it, uh, so yep. as you said, in a free way or in a way of free market. But I yep. have still one more question. Yep. If they already have somebody waiting for this grain in Africa or in some Asia countries, I don't know where exactly, but still, and someone who is going to buy it, um, uh, why are you building up another one who buys your grain when you already have someone who is waiting for it? Uh, you you made one assumption that somebody is waiting or somebody has paid for the grain. That's not the case. That's the problem. So United Nations uh, raised this big issue of famine, of Africa dying because of the war. Many, um, hundreds of millions of people would suffer uh, malnutrition. But in fact, if I was UN official, I would say, well, please sell it to me so that I have it in the storage I would pay to Polish farmers for storing this grain, extra grain, and where we, when we have the spare capacity, we would export it to the countries of destination. But uh, when uh, there was this 
a PR campaign conducted by Russia with UN that there is famine, that you remember even Lukashenko wanted to uh, uh, provide a helping hand saying you can export grain through the territory of Belarus. And that was like uh, Ukraine was put in the situation that it is a problem with this situation in, in this context. But when Ukraine delivered grain to Poland, U UN can easily solve the problem by providing assistance in the situation. But what we see from UN, it does nothing. It just keeps silent. And that is another uh, evidence that the United Nations is the organization that the world, if it disappeared, would never notice. In a way, yes, but there is another thing. We unfortunately can notice some, uh, some of the issues that follow because they are doing something. And it might have been an intrigue uh, in common with Russia. I'm trying to figure out maybe they were doing it on purpose altogether because I don't think that uh, Ukrainian farmers uh, or that uh, precise company uh, uh, was willing to get any problems by selling the grain. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, they just wanted to have a way to export the grain and to stay, uh, well, with some money and possibilities, notwithstanding the hard times that uh, Ukraine is facing right now. So I'm thinking, uh, why did not UN assist in that question? Why did they all uh, wait until the situation uh, blows up with these new uh, scandals? Uh, because uh, now we have a side that suffers from uh, from that. Well, Poland is suffering, uh, you know, Ukrainian farmers also are uh, a victim. Uh, we have uh, Czech Republic, we have Hungary, we have some of this uh, flavor of the conflict that shouldn't have been, right? So right. I think in this situation, well, of course, uh, what we are witnessing is the weakness and fragility of the international order of uh, WTO and EU itself. Because you remember the first reaction from Brussels was that Poland doesn't have the right to do it. So allegedly it yeah. broke the rules of free area as Ukraine was granted this right to import goods from Ukraine to European Union. As Poland is a part of the customs union, uh, it is not responsible or it cannot set rules of the customs union uh, single-handedly. It should be in coordination with other members. And uh, But at, at the same time, there are like uh, emergency cases and Poland uh, uh, used this uh, uh, opportunity to introduce emergency measures, uh, stating that uh, Ukraine broke some basic fundamental rules of uh, free trade. But anyway, now we see that the governments of Ukraine and Poland and other Eastern European countries are in touch and they're solving all, the, all of uh, that um, yeah, hopefully, you know, that's, I keep repeating that Ukraine is a wonderful opportunity for the European Union to get rid of over-regulation of the burden of this uh, socialism that it is deep in. And uh, uh, again, if Ukraine uh, embraces all European regulation with the uh, weak institutions it has, uh, I would see that it would never ensure long-term fast economic growth it deserves. So essentially it should rather model its policy on uh, uh, 1990s Estonia or 1990s uh, Ireland rather than Greece, France and Germany and Poland as, uh, they, are, as they are today. Too tough regulated, I see. Okay, um, what's the next subject we're going to discuss tonight? Yeah, the next subject is about uh, foreign investors because uh, there were two major international investment forums held by Ukrainians. Okay. And uh, that's about uh, the appeal appeal or the measures that Ukrainian government is offering uh, for investors and trying to attract them. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one uh, forum in conference, recovery conference in Rome, 
Mm. And uh, there was a Ukrainian Scandinavian Economic Forum. And now the Ukrainian government is getting ready for Lugano 2 summit in Switzerland with uh, many businessmen. And that is another opportunity to present the case for Ukraine. The Ukrainian government in this case is acting as a rather as a consulting company or agency to promote uh, investment opportunities instead of delivering on the macroeconomic institutional reforms. Because when we have uh, like Mr. The President, when he talked to Italians, he said that uh, he is interested in five key areas. Energy, which is obvious, energy, right? We have construction, we have technology, we have access to global markets and cooperation in pharmaceuticals and physical rehabilitation. And when the President talks about these things, which are in line with uh, what uh, Prime Minister Schmigel earlier said about the 10 priorities of his government, we see this evident role, uh, evident approach to policymaking as a uh, manual management of business and structure of the economy. Ukrainian economy has never had a structure, uh, its structure in a, which it was formed in a free market mode. It was part of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union evidently was not about free market and uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the last 30 years, that was uh, like uh, in the mode of uh, post-Soviet uh, agrarian raw materials, uh, transit of uh, energy goods, nothing else. So regulation and taxation killed uh, the uh, with the efforts of uh, many Ukrainians and foreigners to uh, overhaul its structure. Now, if uh, Ukrainian government uh, after the war uh, tries to manually uh, design the structure of the economy instead of free market, we would have another reincarnation or another copy of the interventionist of socialist economy. Now, that's a big danger because instead of saying that we would, I would, if I were president or prime minister of Ukraine, I would say, you know, dear investors, we uh, welcome you with the most innovative monetary policy where we have six currencies in circulation so you don't have any transaction costs. We have just three taxes. They are flat, they are simple, and even a, a teenager can handle them without any accountants. We have international, we have English uh, court system here, and if you case you have any problems, you go don't go to Ukrainian court, you go to international court. You have, we have privatization, we have free market, and we have competition of standards and norms of, uh, of quality of goods. So welcome to Ukraine, and you will feel like in Hong Kong in the 70s or 80s, or you will feel like in Taiwan or Ireland. Uh, so we will solve your problems with China, so we'll uh, because right now many uh, big uh, value chains uh, want to diversify from China due to uh, geopolitical tensions. We can uh, really provide a lot of uh, capacity to uh, the military uh, facilities, military business that many companies in the European Union and America have. Uh, we can provide uh, energy support, of course, based on access to uh, land and to raw material that we have. But the dialogue should be that the government does its job and you're welcome to make the best use of the business opportunities. The government shouldn't act as a businessman. That's a different role because this is what a corporate state is about. It uh, interferes with business by exercising its monopoly power of using very many things. And what I see from these investment forums, and it's a copy of the forum that uh, Ukrainian government had in Lugano in June 2022, that there is a strong kind of in incentive of the government of Ukraine to act as a marketing agency, as a consulting agency, rather than the government that creates conditions, sets mm. the best 
investment and business climate for whoever wants to invest into Ukraine. And by doing that, I don't think that many uh, serious investors who study uh, legal framework, who study uh, tax uh, issues, who study regulation, who study the uh, purchasing power of Ukrainian market can decide to uh, come here. You know, in 2022, when the war can this enter this hot heated phrase uh ukraine created this wow effect everybody was uh, uh amazed was uh, mesmerized was uh, uh, really shocked positively by the bravery and heroism of ukrainian army and people right now in economic policy we should provide this wow effects to the whole world so investors whatever it is in Scandinavia in Rome in Washington in Bonn in London see that we are serious about long term economic reforms and these reforms should definitely be free market one note that ukraine has never in 32 years even offered a free market reform proposals to the whole world hence it is one of the poorest if not the poorest countries in Europe, and it has been in the state of investment famine for many, many years. Um, we're discussing those two forums that already were held, one in yep. Rome and the second one in Scandinavian countries, um, and the one that was in Lugano a year ago. Yep, exactly. And, and one that is coming. Yes. The next one yep. in Lugano which should be resuming, so to say, the main one, or I yeah, it's should like say annual, so. That's like an annual conference that turned into investment forum or presentation of Ukrainian government, Ukrainian business. I saw the program where uh, there are many Ukrainian uh, CEOs, directors, <laughs> many, I think many VIPs will be there. But again, if it, <laughs> like, what we need is not like uh, marketing of biz business proposals. What we need is serious efforts to start institutional reforms. And we're talking about monetary policy. We should talk about fiscal policy. We should talk about privatization, social security, trade. This is things that definitely matter for investors. They will understand where to invest themselves. They have a lot of connections. But in fact, well, uh, they still don't know anything about the plans of the government to reform uh, those weak institutions that uh, hamper investment and development. All right. The point is that uh, invest right now, for many, looks a little risky and maybe not a little. So well, the conditions, is, yeah. the conditions should be more interesting than somewhere in Europe and not as in Europe, because Absolutely. as in Europe plus risks is not very interesting. You can uh, find, so to say, more safe places with yep. the same conditions. Yep. So we need to offer be better conditions than they have. And we can do it only if we really free the market. Uh, finally, uh, we are all actually waiting for this moment. And, um, well, maybe war is a little bit, uh, how should I say? Um, it's an additional uh, risk factor that must be taken into account, no doubt about it. But even in the state of war, I met some investors here during the war. They uh, were willing to invest even in the military um, uh, plants, uh, but they wanted to have a kind of a understanding of uh, the of the market of who would buy their products. Uh, and they, didn't, uh, they didn't have it, so we have the uh, poor state of governance, both on the corporate and government level, and that what is a major stumbling block for Ukraine to attract investors. No matter how many times you said that you weight investors in pharmaceuticals, agricultural business, blah, 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 but when you analyze what's going on, uh, how what problems uh, Ukrainian businesses face, like blocking of VAT invoices, you no, re now resuming of uh, tax inspections. You have severe hunger of credit in the domestic market because of the stifling regulation. And we must 
uh, we expect from the government to deliver on these issues. And instead of delivering on these issues, they talk about let's invest in pharmaceuticals, let's invest in uh, whatever, old construction. What for? Come on, guys. The next uh, part, we will talk about uh, the uh, reforms and the tax reform yep. precisely. But one more question about uh, that theme. Um, does it look like that those who CEOs or any other people who were interested uh, went there to look for these kind of investors and investments and that they came back with some reports and maybe they made those reports and maybe these reports look as if someone has interest. Maybe they, um, how do you say, hypnotize uh, themselves. Oh, they returned uh, back home and they're telling one another, I'm getting investment from here, I'm getting investment from there. And that might be a, well, hypnose in a way. <laughs> uh, and they report to also to the office of the president that we have plenty of plans, that we have investors that are willing to come next year or, or whatever, but that may be all uh, just uh, a um, bluff. Right. Um, well, uh, but yeah, I can tell you, give you one example of the magic uh, in inverted commas document called the letter of intent. So all these wow. forums, documents, you know, where you sign up letters of intent saying that, well, we are considering uh, investment into this particular sector and there is a sum of money like uh, varying from 10, 100 to $1 billion or even more, depending on what kind of letter of intent you, you prepare. And uh, the government officials tend to uh, identify them to the president and to government to decision makers as real investment. And that is, uh, okay. these are two That's different worlds. Question, I'm not an economist. That's, because, that's just what I was thinking. But yeah. I, re, if, I imagined if that would be a forum of theatrical um, actors, yeah, it's, regisseurs it's, and directors and, uh, and whatever, conductors. And if they came all together and uh, afterwards they're getting home back and saying to all of them, we are having plans, we're having and so on, so on, so on. And they're selling something that may never happen. They are selling the air, as uh, we here in our countries used to say, right? So it's like putting on airs and selling air, putting on airs. And essentially, it's like, I remember after the first Lugano summit in uh, June uh, 2022, when Mr. Gitmansev, who was the brains, uh, uh, the organizer and the uh, the main person behind it, he said that, well, we prepared and presented plans to attract $750 billion. And everybody was, wow, 700, and that's all what Ukraine would get? And if you, I analyze this particular plan, and that was rubbish, that it was a disaster. At the same okay. time, many people in the government believe that that was a success. Come on, guys. If well, that's it's so easy to check whether it was success or failure by by analyzing how much money was invested into the economy of Ukraine in 2022. So not like letters of intent or whatever other documents were signed, but real money that came in. And if you look at the balance of payment, and you look at the financial account. You do, and all like portfolio investment line, you see almost uh, digits or numbers close to zero. So, what kind of uh, investment success are you talking about? That's again, you, you should not confuse two things the behavior of professional eco economists like myself and the behavior of managers and businessmen. These are two different professions. And the Ukrainian government put them all together, and the result is kind of uh, an uh, investment disaster. And it will be like that if the government uh, does not make major amendments in its the way it presents itself. That's why when uh, I make presentations of my book, which has this strategy for Ukraine, which states clearly what should be done and what wow effects could be presented on behalf of uh, Ukraine so that it becomes an investment maker. 
very good because otherwise there uh, will be only disappointments about not getting uh, all these type of investments that were in the air but were never caught. Yep. Okay, uh, so let's see uh, what should be done uh, in order to really make the conditions so <laughs> that the uh, investments would flow into Ukraine. Well, that's another topic. Probably we can dedicate the whole program or two to that. But I think that Next better time concentrate. That way, but, right. But I think that I think that uh, <laughs> that was actually what I <laughs> that, that was the preview, so to say, because uh, the next topic that we're going to discuss is the tax tax reform. Right. Tax reform. And fake I think tax that reform, this I is the say. basics. Yep. If the taxes yep. are low and uh, attractive for business investments will come almost automatically. Well, well, it's, uh, well, every time you talk to investors and uh, people who are consultants, uh, in the top five pro programs, number one is always rule of law and uh, protection of property rights. Without that, you can, uh, no matter what you say, if you don't have this kind of legal framework, nobody would come with serious money, but right now, when you talk about investors, you don't talk about like somebody who buys a machine or equipment. You buy, you talk about intellectual property rights, you about physical property rights. And I without have that, to ask a question. Yeah. I understand what you say. And probably the most effective way would be if uh, anyone could uh, uh, go to the British court directly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's what any we should problem have that is branch that of the British court in Ukraine. Ukraine. But there is still something that should be solved. <laughs> uh, first, uh, the British courts are much more expensive. Uh, you have to pay the fees and not everyone is able to do it. So uh, it means that there will be fact, practically a parallel of uh, British court system and of yep. uh, Ukrainian court system. Of course, and those exactly. who, can, who can afford will have just just courts in Britain, and those who cannot afford will still remain in Ukraine, so to say. No, That's I mean that we would have British courts imported to Ukraine. Uh, that's what okay. is done by Hong Kong, that was done in uh, okay. some uh, Arab countries. If we do not have respected, respectable institution uh, that ensures and guarantees property rights, the easiest and the most effective way is to import that and then cherish and create it from scratch on the local level. Right now, the okay. only way to deal with the judicial and court system is to abolish it altogether. Because I like, see. The, uh, practically, we can say that if the government would make an agreement with uh, yep. uh, Great Britain about the court system and practically import into Ukraine, as it was done in Hong Kong, the British court system, yep. that would be of much yep, greater absolutely. help absolutely. for investments Super. than all these travels to Lugano with the... Uh, absolutely. The, 10 points and so on. Absolutely. Just imagine, okay. again, another wonderful wow effect thing that we will uh, make English, the English language or the second state language in Ukraine. That's a wonderful opportunity. And we could begin with it from children, from kindergartens uh, and school, high school, yes, primary Yes, in the kindergartens schools, exactly. we could have uh, this nursery system because children are taught basically from three years of age. And uh, yep. I think there are some, well, people who would like to come and teach uh, English yeah. uh, to Ukrainian yeah, children. There are many things that we can easily and gladly import from Great Britain, including insurance system, which is one of the best in the world, including banking system, including stock market experience, including the military equipment and production. You name it. It's like... If we just imagine the British Empire giving a helping hand to Ukraine and mm -hmm. making it a superpower, which uh, in, is in sync with the biggest challenges that the way faces, that's a really great opportunity. But what we again, we uh, want to uh, elaborate a little bit on the fake tax reform that was announced by the government and Mr. Uh, Gitmansev, and that is uh, a very good case to show how to not 
conduct economic policy. Because instead of uh, having a meaningful dialogue with business community, with the scholars, experts on what uh, kind of a tax system Ukraine should have, Mr. Gitmansev is thinking rather about the welfare of tax inspectors, of tax police, of tax workers. And this draft law, there's a lot of attention which he pays to the welfare of these people because they are uh, like, you know, the wolf in the uh, in the chicken house. And uh, there is no way this person who is a Marxist, who is a uh, supporter of authoritarian ideas and the person who is uh, uh, accused by many journalists of being the assistant, assistant of one of the Russian spies could deliver meaningful reforms. So this guy uh, is one of the biggest uh, black spots on the uh, uniform of the Ukrainian government right now. And uh, he... Uh, he insists on uh, canceling, on abolishing the 2% tax that was introduced in the beginning of the war. He uh, agreed with the IMF, a problem that was his own proposal, to resume tax inspections. He does not think about meaningful, disciplined, and high-quality fiscal policy because in 2022, in 2023 and four. Uh, the average annual budget deficit would be like 24% of GDP. That means that the country is not sustainable. It's totally dependent on the assistance from the uh, foreign partners. Uh, its uh, government expenditures in 2022 uh, were close to 70% of GDP, which is uh, an evidence, uh, a sign of uh, Ukrainian economy in the state of the military socialism, 70% of GDP. Uh, uh, to compare that with Belarus and Russia, that Russia and Belarus had 35% of GDP. Just imagine, 60. So instead of relying on the best minds of the West to form the dream team government, Mr. Gitmansev and his colleagues relied on uh, heavy government intervention. And uh, essentially, of course, they created a situation when business is highly disappointed by uh, the behavior of the government, by the tax reform. And instead of creating favorable business climbing that Mr. President and Prime Minister promised, we are having uh, the situation when Ukraine can really be ranked 126, 130 in the Economic Freedom Index. Uh, it is not in the first 100 countries in the quality of uh, property rights protection. And with this kind of... Uh, uh, environment and quality of institutions, you must be very brave in presenting tax reform and fiscal reform. Instead of that, we see Mr. Gitmansev, who believes that the best businessman, investor, and manager of resources is the government. And that is what socialism is all about. So, uh, no matter how many Lugano forums, Rammstein, Finance Rammstein, are held, Mr. Gitmansev is the one who makes decisions and makes proposals, and unfortunately, he's still in power. He's still there. That's why in this kind of fake tax reforms, uh, Ukrainian government, Ukrainian authorities are losing very unique asset that it had a year ago. Trust of the whole world. Um, yes, uh, there is another thing that we should discuss uh, before we uh, finish the program. Uh, uh, to defend uh, that type of reform, uh, himself and uh, his surrounding, they keep saying to everyone in Ukraine that these, well, changements that you don't like are the changements that are expected from the European Union. We must do it to um, satisfy the European Union. Uh, since we are going to be a part of European Union, that is what they want us to be like. And the point is very important point to for our viewers. We should we should 
have a precise uh, overview. When did all these countries build up their benefits and build up their uh, profitable economy? They built it up before in previous years when they did not have these uh, tax burdens that as they have right now. Right now they're eating it away, all the benefits that they built up before. About the United States, when, uh, when became United States the first economy of the world? After it had about uh, 60 years of ma of almost no taxes at all. No, so like if you want to, to build up mm. a, a strong economy, you have to free the market and you have to lower uh, Taxation, all the right. taxes. And then you will have quite quick the development of the market and you will have quite quick the uh, development. Yeah, right. Uh, well, so one, there is one... Uh, but you have to uh, justify what you offer if you believe in it. Uh, if we follow this logic, well, what would our European partners say? If we follow that logic, you know, remember in uh, February 2022, NATO, Rand Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, very many so people in the American hours. government, they say, well, you should have surrendered. Well, uh, three days and you'll be have you've been crushed by Russia. Ukrainian people, Ukrainian society and the army thought differently. And that's why we are alive. We are fighting for freedom, for independence. And we proved NATO, America and EU to be wrong, including Schultz, including Macron, including Italy and including the American administration. Likewise, in development, this is not a... a uh, rank and file case. Well, Ukraine is in the state of war. Uh, what European uh, Union people and American and G7 countries are afraid of is that Ukraine would rely on more and more assistance instead of building up in kind of independent uh, fiscal policy. Uh, what Gitmansev doesn't get, and it's many people who are tax people, lawyers without economic background, is that by lowering tax rates and easing tax administration, you will increase government revenues. Something that they don't get. We have a lot of evidence, historical evidence, to prove that. When you remember when in the beginning of the 2000s, when we fought for flat tax rate, personal tax rates, and they were down to 12%, 13% in Russia, and instead of uh, getting less tax revenues, we got times more tax revenues based on that. Likewise here, if you have gray economy in Ukraine, like 50% uh, of GDP, if you have the tax burden that forces people into gray area or not any economic activities at all, when you sure. offer free and fair and uh, transparent taxes, flat taxes, not on, on value added, not on income, which are very um, uh, vague concepts. I offered three tax system to the Ukrainian government with calculations, with revenues and with uh, balanced budget after the war. It's very easy to see that based on uh, the tax system that we offered, Ukrainian government would get more money, more revenue, even in the state of war. But Gitmansev is so... Uh, such a hardliner, he's a dogmatic person, he doesn't want to listen to any arguments because, first, he's an authoritarian guy, he believes in Marxism and he believes in Leviathan. And these are things that are not based on uh, uh, economic science or on evidence, these are things based on beliefs. So he's a mystic, and with mysticism, you can hardly do anything but, you know, you should get remove him from power. You can hardly handle. Okay, <laughs> so now I think we should uh, make an announcement that next time uh, you will present the wow effects that you have yeah. in your book. I have Good. 14 wow effects, and if uh, Ukrainian government delivers at least on half of them, I'm sure that we will have uh, inflow of investment of technologies and the whole world will talk about not uh, Ukrainian bravery and army and Zelensky as the hero of the world, but we'll talk about economic miracle or the origin of economic miracle in Ukraine. Uh, to say more, it is very much uh, 
in the character of Ukrainians. Yep, and absolutely. historically, it is very much in the character. So uh, let's hope for the best. I yeah. mean about the economical reform. Yeah, well, you, th you know that uh, that that's the paradox of the situation. This 80 years or about 100 years of Soviet rule, socialist rule, oligarch rule, well, made many people believe that that's the part of the Ukrainian national character. When we get back to those old roots of wonderful traditions of freedom, voila, well, we definitely uh, should get back to those roots and show Ukrainians what uh, Ukraine can be. The great talents for yep. very free and big and successful market. Okay, so thank you very much uh, My pleasure, for uh, being thank with you. me tonight and uh, for uh, finding time and so many interesting answers. And I hope next time we talk about we'll talk about the wow effect. effect. And see you very soon. Very much looking Bye -bye. forward to. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.